sole source for live meetings. The Government Channel presents... Welcome to Straightforward Conversation. I'm Gary Hunter. My guest this evening is Charles Skip Fossler, Director of Athletic Services at Ohio University. Uh, Skip is from Piqua, Ohio, and has a Bachelor of Science degree from Defiance College and a Master's degree from Ball State University. Skip is a certified athletic trainer and is licensed in the state of Ohio. Since 1971, excuse me, he has been a head athletic trainer at Ohio University. Welcome, Skip. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation of athletic injuries. Having said that mouthful, Skip, <laughs> I, I think we'll try a little bit smaller piece. What does an athletic trainer at Ohio University do? Well, the athletic trainer at Ohio University's primary responsibility is to uh, the welfare of the athlete, the health welfare of the athlete. Uh, we're primarily concerned about prevention of injuries, uh, we're also concerned about the immediate treatment of injuries once they occur, and then the rehabilitation of those injuries uh, following the uh, initial injury. What does it mean to be certified and licensed as an athletic trainer? Well, I know that's a little misnomer, but uh, certification is uh, obtained through the National Athletic Trainers Association, which is the national governing body for uh, the athletic trainer. Uh, that has been in... Uh, works since 1969. Uh, then in 1989, uh, in order to uh, practice in the state of Ohio, it was felt by the athletic trainers and, and the legislative branch that uh, we should be licensed in the state of Ohio and control uh, who is practicing uh, athletic training and how they were practicing athletic training. And uh, that became uh, started in 1989 and is uh, officially a recognized board with the athletic trainers, uh, the uh, occupational therapists, and the physical therapists. Who is on that board? Is it uh, physicians, trainers, or a It's just made up of those parties, uh, two member, three members from the athletic trainers group, three members, I think, or four members from the occupational therapy group and physical therapy. Does it require some sort of continuing education to maintain your certification? Yes, you have to have uh, continuing education where you maintain at least three credits per year. Uh, and it's the same way with certification. So uh, an athletic trainer must have over a three-year period nine certain continuing education credits. I know you've been the athletic trainer here at Ohio University for a very long period of time. And I also know that the trainer program, student trainer program in Ohio is very well respected mm -hmm. across the country. But if I want to become a trainer, what kind of courses would I expect to be taking in college? You're going to be taking courses very similar to pre-med. Um, you're going to, our students are primarily biological science majors as well as the athletic trainer. Ohio University is one of the few schools that has a bachelor's degree in athletic training. Uh, we're very proud of our program here at Ohio University. Uh, we've been in existence, really, our program since 1972, and we've had a number of people who have graduated and who have done quite well in the profession. We feel that the education of the athletic trainer is very important and therefore our coursework has developed uh, to the point where we feel we are the, one of the strongest programs in the country. How many varsity sports do you provide trainers for and though two-part question for you, and how many student trainers do you have under your supervision? Well at the present time there are 18 varsity sports within the intercollegiate athletic department but we also cover uh, the cheerleaders uh, we also cover the uh, marching band, which is very unusual, and not many schools do that. And then we also cover the you club sports. Marching band members get injured? Yes. Our marching band, uh, in particular, with our dance routines and so forth, come up with a number of injuries. So we have felt it was very important for us to provide some type of coverage for them and, and treat their injuries as they occur also. What about the club sports, which is Club hockey? sports, we cover well, ice we hockey. Know they yes, we cover ice hockey, uh, rugby, uh, soccer. And, of course, women's soccer will be uh, a uh, primary sport in our collegiate athletic department this next year. So with all of these club sports, the cheerleaders, the band, and the varsity sports, 
How many student trainers do you have? Well, we have, at the present time, we have 52 student trainers. Uh, we also have 10 staff members uh, that uh, are the supervisors for these students. And each supervisor is assigned several different sports and they are responsible for the students. We also have some graduate athlete trainers who are also out into the high school uh, uh, coverage, providing coverage for uh, all their sports uh, in 21 different high schools throughout this area. Wow. Is there a, a role for an athletic trainer in the development of training regiments for athletes? Well, athlete training is one component of, of the total fitness of the athlete. Uh, we work with a lot of different individuals. We work with the uh, exercise physiologists. We work with the uh, uh, strength coaches. We work with the nutritionists, uh, the school, the psychologists. Uh, sports psychology is becoming a, a, a big market now and so we spend a lot of time working with each of these areas to help develop the athlete to their ultimate and uh, we hope at Ohio University that we're getting close to that. Is there a difference in training regiments depending on the sport that an athlete might participate in? Yes, each sport has their own needs. Uh, you know, in football, it, it's going to be a stronger athlete, but at the same time, we're looking for uh, to maintain endurance as well as speed. Whereas in track, you may be looking more at speed rather than the uh, strength factor. Although you want them strong, it will not be the s in the same values. And then in the female sports, where uh, this is becoming a primary concern, is that a lot of our female athletes are not conditioned athletes when they come into our program. So therefore, we have to spend more time with those um, young ladies in order to help prevent injuries from occurring. Well, stay tuned. Skip and I will return after this commercial break. When we do, I want to ask Skip about whether it's myth or fact that male athletes should have male trainers and female athletes should have female trainers. Someone out there needs help and you've decided to save them. Every year, thousands of people die waiting for organ and tissue transplants. To be a donor, even if you've signed something, you must tell your family now so they can carry out your decision later. Otherwise, it's like throwing a 12-foot rope to someone who's 15 feet away. Share your life. Share your decision. This is Bob Hope asking you to support the National Federation of the Blind. Do you know what blind people are like? Well, they're pretty much like you. They laugh at something funny, but not because of blindness. And they cry if they have a reason to, but not because of blindness. Blind people work and play just like you. They worry about the rent and how to get ahead just like you. And they hope and dream just like you. Blindness doesn't stop them, but prejudice and misunderstanding may. Today, blind people are working as lawyers, teachers, factory workers, farmers, homemakers, scientists, and even comedians. The blind need opportunity, not pity. For information, contact the National Federation of the Blind, 1800 Johnson Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21230. That address again is 1800 Johnson Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21230. Picasso painted the old guitarist during a period of depression that lasted four years, his blue period. Today, with new discoveries, 80% of depressive disorders are being successfully treated, giving hope to millions that maybe now, nobody has to have a blue period. Welcome back to Straightforward Conversation. My guest this evening is Skip Vossler, Director of Athletic Services at Ohio University. Skip, just before the break, I was about to ask you about a myth or fact, that myth or fact being whether male athletes should be attended by male trainers and female athletes attended by female trainers. Now, I'm sure if I were to ask you that question 20 years ago, what your answer would be. What is your answer today? Today, it's a myth. Uh, Back around 1977 is where we saw the surgeons towards uh, female athlete trainers uh, becoming very interested in, in athlete training and working with uh, the athletic programs. Uh, since that time, uh, our programs uh, in recruiting of students has uh, really been at around 57% female and the remainder being male. So 
the females are really starting to become very strongly interested in this field. At the same time, uh, we find that, uh, it, it's unusual to say this, but we find that sometimes the female athlete trainer sometimes is a better athlete trainer because they have a little better concern for the athletes. Sometimes uh, as male athletes, we just uh, assume that the injury will take care of itself and, and pressure the athlete to uh, go through rehab, whereas the female athlete has a little bit more concern for that athlete. I think we're all aware that trainers have a spend part of their time at least in the locker room. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you're telling me that you have no problems in sending female trainers into male locker rooms? And most, of our, male most of our locker rooms are designed to, uh, to allow uh, privacy as far as dressing, but once the activity starts, then our females are in the locker room. Uh, uh, there are times where you have to deal with uh, specific injuries regarding males, if, if it was a female or with female athletes as a male. Uh, injuries will occur to different areas of the body and we're trained to, to handle that. It's a professional care that we're providing under the uh, guidance of the team physicians. So uh, we have no problem with females being in the locker room or around the locker room. Have the athletes themselves accepted this co-educational experience? Well, there is no doubt. Uh, the athletes accepted uh, extremely well. In fact, better than maybe some parents and uh, other officials. Uh, even in our, the athletic trainers that we provide to the high schools, a um, number of these uh, people are female athletic trainers going out to the high school as a head athletic trainer. In fact, Athens High School, I think over the last 10 years, uh, seven of them have been female. So uh, I don't think the athletes have a problem with female athletic trainers. I think the important thing is, is do they provide the service? And, and uh, we hope that we do. We all know that about 10, 12 years ago now, the, the AIDS virus became a widespread, almost epidemic across this country. Has your training procedures been modified as a result of the arrival of the AIDS virus? We're under the OSHA requirements uh, as a state university, so therefore we have to meet all the rules that, that govern that particular uh, problem. Um, it's a concern for us because the, naturally when you're dealing with athletic injuries, you're dealing with a lot of blood. Uh, lacerations, uh, scrapes, and so forth. Uh, if you get on turf, then you get the turf burns, and, and so you see a lot of blood. And we tried to teach our students and our staff to handle these injuries appropriately with gloves. Uh, we take precautions as far as blood on uniforms and, and using solutions to clean that particular area. Uh, we do have a concern where uh, athletes w will meet one-on-one, -on -one, blood on blood, where they don't have that protection. So there is a concern uh, throughout the nation about uh, the, the AIDS virus, but at the same time, uh, I, I cannot give you an incident uh, today where uh, the AIDS virus has been involved with intercollegiate athletics. Which raises another issue then. Have we gone too far in expecting this to be a problem? Uh, for instance, in the basketball floor, I notice if we have a, a player receive a, what might be a fairly a nosebleed, uh, I see if you stop the game, they change the shirt, right. uh, you put on gloves. Uh, I don't. Know, I suppose you disinfect right. the floor. Right. I, you know, I don't know what else you do. Well, we try. What we're trying to do, Gary, is is to prevent a problem from occurring. Uh, I think only history will tell us uh, how how big of a problem the AIDS virus is in athletics. Um, the thing, important thing is, is if you take the precautionary measures, then you'll stop the problem from, from ever existing, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, it is a concern, and uh, we naturally will try to do uh, or provide every precaution that we can for all athletes who participate. If it's such a problem, and apparently the athletic associations feel that it might be, I don't necessarily the mm -hmm. trainers, why do we not require uh, mandatory testing for AIDS of, of college athletes? That's a good question. Uh, it's being discussed uh, right today, I mean, as far as uh, different uh, intercollegiate athletic programs throughout the country. Uh, it becomes a legal question, I think, right now. And uh, if we want to enter that area of concern, uh, then I think it's going to have to be faced in the courts. Um, We've been facing that problem with drug testing. Uh, it's been recognized that drug testing is legal. Uh, we at Ohio University uh, have drug testing. 
Uh, we do do blood exams as far as our athletes, as far as their physicals are concerned. The, we do not test for the AIDS virus, though. But I think that uh, at some point in time uh, in the next few years, that will become a, a major uh, concern in the court system, I would imagine. Let's change gears a little bit. How much of a trainer's time is spent on, say, prevention versus treatment? Well, back in the early 60s when I started, we spent a lot of time with prevention. But fortunately, with, with uh, education, the development of exercise physiology, the development of a strength and conditioning coaches, uh, developing of the nutritional programs, uh, that has made our task a lot easier. Uh, so we work with those people in order to prevent injuries. We look at equipment to make sure that the equipment is, is the right type of equipment to protect injuries. We look at the environment the athletes are participating in to make sure that uh, there are no possible ways that injuries could occur. And so a lot of our time now is spent with the rehabilitation uh, of athletic injuries because it takes so much more time to uh, uh, provide that care for the injury. So your time in, in early days, uh, actually I shouldn't say early days because I've seen training's been around <laughs> longer than the 30 years right. you've been doing it. Uh, in the time you've been doing it, uh, you've gone from an area where training spent more time in prevention and treatment, and mm -hmm. now it's more treatment and rehabilitation. Exactly. And we feel that the rehabilitation is very important because it's uh, with the surgical techniques that uh, our physicians are using, uh, the, our rehab programs have become far more extensive. Uh, the type of uh, modalities that we use, uh, the, uh, the uh, isokinetic equipment that we have available to test, uh, allows us to do a lot more with the athlete in order to get them back to almost 100 percent by the time they start participating again. At least in my opinion to be effective in any profession uh, you have to be able to project the right kind of personality and then be very competent once, once you're able to win a person's confidence. In your opinion what's the ideal personality of a trainer? I think uh, the ideal personality of a trainer, an athletic trainer, is a person who has uh, a concern for the athlete, who has a, a good sense uh, and education for athletic injuries, a person who can recognize an athlete when they have a problem. Uh, so you involve a lot of different areas as an athletic trainer. Uh, you have to recognize what the coach desires. Uh, and what the player desires. So it's, it's important for the athletic trainer to be able to work with both areas because uh, there's a lot of confidential things that the athletes say to you and while you're working with them they'll express it more. Uh, then you have to make a decision do you want to take that to the coach or not take it to the coach. At the same time you hear the comments of the coaches about athletes and, and naturally the coaches don't want those comments to be made to the athlete. So it, it's a person who has a lot of trust a person who uh, has the ability to communicate, and a person who is able to get along with people. Do you communicate this, these thoughts to your trainers? Yes, we do, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> well, stay tuned. When Skip and I will return after this commercial break. When we do, I want to touch upon the topic of uh, the relationship between the trainer and a coach. Welcome back to Straightforward Conversation. My guest this evening is Skip Bossler, Director of Athletic Services at Ohio University. Skip, before the break, I was about to ask you about the relationship between a trainer and a coach. First, I'm going to ask you, is there one? Yes, uh, it's important to have a, a good relationship with each of the coaches that you work with. Um, for example, myself, I'm primarily working with uh, your brother, Coach Larry Hunter, in basketball, and then Jim Grow in football. Uh, but I also have to work with each of the other coaches. Uh, and each coach has their own personality. Uh, they all have their Boy, desires. <laughs> they all have their desires that they want for their particular team and for each of their athletes. So it's important as an athletic trainer that uh, you study your coaches, uh, that you evaluate the coaches and what you've, their expectations are, and you try to work with them as, as well as possible. Uh, I have to say, here at Ohio University, it's, it's been an easy task for me to work with coaches because their expectations are about similar to mine. Uh, their desires for their athletes uh, as far as participation is about the same as mine. 
and uh, the only time you get into disagreement is, is, is the time lost by an athlete once the injury occurs. Naturally, they would like to have the athletes back sooner. Uh, sometimes we, have, we play conservative and take a little bit longer, and that causes a problem once in a while. But uh, we're all adults, and we can work well together. Let me give you a little hypothetical. Attorneys like hypotheticals. Uh, uh, we're in the final week of a championship season for Ohio University in a sport. And if we lose one game more, we're probably not going to be in the race. Mm -hmm. And our star athlete goes down, has been down for a couple weeks. Do you have the authority to preclude? And you don't think that he should be playing in this final game. Mm -hmm. Do you have the authority to preclude the coach from playing him? Uh, yes. Um, it's not my own final authority. It's our team physician's final authority that makes that decision. Uh, uh, the team physician will naturally uh, take my uh, advice because we are the ones who are working with that athlete day in, day out. Uh, normally, we're seeing athletes two or three times a day as far as rehabilitation is concerned. So if you have that star athlete, we're going to be uh, working as hard as we can to get that athlete back. But uh, if we get to that point where we have to make that judgment, uh, naturally it's going to be on the side of the athlete, not for the side of winning or uh, the winning of the game or for the coach. Uh, we have standards that we meet, uh, and we would like that athlete to be at least, after an injury, be at least 90% uh, back compared to their normal uh, limb, if you compare right to left. And so it's important that uh, we use those guides and, and make uh, good rational decisions. What's the dividing line between a trainer and a physician? Well, the team physician has the sole authority, uh, first of all. Secondly, uh, they are the one that makes the, the diagnosis. Um, we're going to see the athlete initially once the injury has occurred. Uh, we're going to evaluate that injury, and then we will pass that on to the physician to make the final call as far as the type of medication procedures that will follow with that athlete. What's the most frequent type of athletic injury that you see here at Ohio University? Well, I think, Gary, the, the, it's natural that you're going to see a lot of leg injuries. Uh, knee injuries uh, are predominant, uh, especially in the female sport. Uh, ankle injuries and foot injuries, uh, those are the predominant ones. Then you get into the contact collision sports, and then naturally you're going to see some shoulder injuries. But if you were to list the predominant injury, it's going to be either the ankle or the knee. Which raises another interesting question. Are college athletes pushing their bodies too far beyond normal limits, and as a result, sustaining injuries that are going to be with them for the rest of their lives? Well, that's an interesting question because, uh, again, only history will tell us. Um, we, uh, I, I feel that the type of education uh, and services that we're providing the athlete uh, will only enhance uh, their future as far as future, uh, problems are concerned. Uh, I think uh, when we started 19, uh, when I started in the 1960s that uh, those athletes that I've seen, I think arthritic conditions have set in and, and a lot of the joints that uh, where injuries have occurred. But since that time, uh, due to better techniques in rehabilitation, uh, better techniques in surgery, uh, the, the better uh, use of medications, uh, I hope we'll resolve some of that. We won't see those arthritic conditions. What are the trends that we're now seeing in conditioning, such as running, weightlifting, diet, I think you mentioned? Well, we want our athletes to be as big as they can get, as strong as they can get, and as fast as they can get. So it, it comes down to uh, uh, working with uh, each area, structured area, and we have the exercise physiologist do the evaluation where we need to go. We use the strength coaches to help us uh, get to the uh, where we need as far as goals for strength. We look at the nutritionist as far as the health, uh, the nutritional factors for the athlete. And the ultimate physician uses all these people and it's important that they get their body to that proper tune uh, so that they can perform at their ultimate. Once an athlete has sustained an injury, he's been properly uh, trained and he still sustains an injury, now he has a rehab period of time. What's the role of the trainer today in rehabilitation? Well, the, the athletic trainer primarily is the one who pushes the athlete. Uh, rehabilitation is not easy. It's probably one of the most difficult things for an athlete to go through. Uh, so therefore, it, it's important that you use the psychological uh, modes uh, with that athlete. Uh, 
and you're trying to take them slowly, but at the same time you're hoping that your progression will get to a point where they will be 100% within a, a certain period of time. Each injury has their own standards that you have to meet, and, and uh, depending upon the injury, if, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, uh, sometimes uh, we prefer surgical over just the normal sprain because the normal sprain sometimes takes much longer than the surgery does. Are you, as a trainer, involved then in developing the rehabilitation program? We, along with the team physician, will develop the program and uh, we set some standards where we want to be after uh, one or two days, then we look at the three to six day uh, mode and then we go from long term from 7 to 14 days and after 14 days then we get into months but uh, each each mode has their own techniques that we have developed and we hope that that progression will again lead them back to activity. Is that why we hear so many times when an athlete is injured to say we expect him to be out two weeks or a week or something there are certain standards that are out there? There are standards out there that you can primarily set up that you know that uh, that, a, for example, a sprained ankle will be, uh, if we say it's a second degree sprain, that it will take about 10 to 21 days. Well, thank you, Skip. This has been a very interesting discussion. This has been Straightforward Conversation with Skip Bossler, Director of um, Athletic <laughs> Services at Ohio University, a new title for you, uh, and good evening.